Walters has worked for Airbus since 1982. He has previously held positions of CTO for Galileo Industries, the company responsible for developing the Galileo Navigation System for the EU, and Airbus Vice President for Navigation Systems in Munich. He was also Engineering Manager for the Rosetta Platform and Project Manager for the James Webb Space Telescope Mid-Infrared Instrument. He is currently the Project Manager for Solar Orbiter, which launched on 10th of February 2020 and is now performing perfectly in space. So uh, I'd like to talk to you today about the Solar Orbiter project. Um, that's a project which has been running for the last nine years or so in the UK, uh, and I'm the project manager. Um, and the spacecraft was launched in February, so I'd like to uh, show you how things are going in space, but also talk to you a little bit about some of the interesting technical challenges and programmatic challenges we've had all along the way. Okay, so let me start then by asking the question why. Why, why is it necessary to study the sun at all? And, um, and why do we have to actually go there to find out? You know, we can do a lot of studies of the sun and have been studying the sun for 400 years uh, from the Earth. Uh, but we find that actually there are plenty of still unknown questions that mean we have to go there really to find out. So the big three questions that we're trying to really try and answer are the following. Um, the sun creates its own heliosphere. It's, it's bubble of gas that surrounds the star, pushes out all the way out to uh, interplanetary space. Um, and that's an enormously big bubble. You, know, you probably know that Voyager has just recently left that heliosphere. It's the only man-made object that's actually done that. And it's far, far, far beyond the, the uh, limit of Pluto. Uh, and the sun creates that, and, and it controls it. And, um, and, and it's, it's quite strange, because we don't really know how the sun is, is really controlling that. So, for instance, if the sun would give off um, a bubble uh, of plasma, which we call a coronal mass ejection, that can travel through the heliosphere in ways that we don't understand. So we can, we can try and measure what happens at Earth, um, but it doesn't seem to correlate at all with what we saw on the sun some days before. So we, we can't get that correlation, you know, what we see on the Earth compared to what we saw on the sun earlier, you know, a few days before. And the second big question is, what makes the solar wind? Where does it come from? How is it made? Um, we're, we're pretty sure it originates in the atmosphere of the sun called the corona, which is extremely hot. Uh, that's another strange problem that we're also trying to understand is, why is the corona so hot? It's more than a million degrees centigrade, whereas the surface of the sun is, is hot, but it's only 6,000 degrees. The corona is much, much, much hotter than that. And that's where the solar wind is originating. But, but how is it made? What, what's the mechanism? We, we don't know. Um, and of course, the solar wind is, is the stuff that finally gets to Earth. So it's, it's, it's quite important for us to know how this, how this stuff is made. And then the, the last one, probably the most puzzling of all from my point of view, is the sun has a, an 11-year activity cycle. So every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field will turn upside down, and the sunspots will increase and decrease with this 11-year cycle. We have no clue why it's 11 years, why it's so regular, what drives that cycle, and no clue. So we really don't know how stars work, and of course the sun is our closest star, but whatever we learn from the sun is pretty useful for, to understand stars in general. Um, so we really have to go there, and we have to go there because we need to be able to match what we see with what we measure local to the spacecraft. And by going there, that, that time lag, if you like, between what we see on the sun and what we measure around the spacecraft is a lot, lot shorter. So pretty good chance if you see something on the sun, you're going to feel it pretty soon after if you're close to the sun and you can get a good correlation then with what's going on. So Solar Orbiter is designed to go um, to within 42 million kilometers of the sun. So we're sitting here at about 150 million kilometers so that's about 0 0.28 of the distance from the Earth, astronomical unit. Um, it's going to take the closest ever images of the Sun, and in fact already has done so, and I'll show you a couple right at the end. Um, no images of the Sun have been taken this close. Uh, and we've only got to about 0.51 AU so far. We're going to get much closer than that over the next few years. Um, the other interesting thing about the orbit is that when we get close to the Sun, it's actually moving quite fast, 
um, as fast almost as the sun is rotating at its surface. And so it means that you can follow features that evolve on the surface of the sun. Um, sitting back here from Earth, a, a sunspot, or for instance, or flare, corona mass ejection will rotate and then in a few days will be gone. But we can follow that round with a spacecraft and measure the evolution of those events on the surface of the sun over, over weeks. So that's um, really something that the, the scientists are very uh, excited about. Then later in the mission, um, we're going to change the orbit to be a much higher inclination. Um, so we're starting off with a few degrees of inclination, but at the end we're going to get up to something like 32, maybe 33 degrees of inclination in the orbit. And that's important because um, we want to have a look at the poles of the Sun, the North and South Pole. No one's ever seen them. Um, Ulysses, the only spacecraft that's taken measurements in the direction of the pole of the Sun, but it had no cameras. So from Earth we can't see them at all. We just get a, a side-on glimpse of them. And why is that important? Well, that's where the magnetic field is coming from, and the magnetic field of the Sun is driving everything. Um, so it, we need to go take a look, and it's going to be the first ever pictures once we get there around about 2025, 2026. Um, the first ever pictures of the poles of the Sun. It's going to be amazing. And, and we're going to achieve all of this science with really a unique combination, and I'll explain that a little bit more later about four instruments, what we call the in-situ instruments, that measure the local environment of the spacecraft, and six remote sensing instruments, which measure what's happening on the sun, or just around the sun, in its atmosphere, and so on. And, and, and the, if you like, juxtaposition between the in-situ instruments and the remote sensing instruments, they give us that correlation that we're looking for. What's, what's happening on the sun right now, and then what do we feel at the spacecraft some hours, or, or maybe a day or two later? Uh, and that's going to enable us to do something that we cannot do uh, from the distance of the Earth. And ultimately, um, I would say the goal of really trying to understand our sun is so that we can predict it. How is it going to behave? If we see something today, what will happen tomorrow? What will happen in a week's time? At the moment, we don't have that power uh, because we don't have a model. Um, so once we understand how the sun works, the next stage would be to make a model and then the next stage would be to make a, a, a forecasting tool, a predictor of what we're now calling space weather. So uh, you probably all know uh, that we do from time to time get coronal mass ejections coming our way. Uh, we don't know how to predict when and how big they're going to be. Uh, the last big one was what they call the Carrington event in 1859. Um, and there wasn't much infrastructure or technology at the time, but whatever there was, the telegraph networks and so on, they were shut down. Um, the event of such a corona mass ejection these days, if it was as big as the Carrington event or even bigger, would be fairly catastrophic. And it's something that we really, really want to be able to predict um, so that we can take mitigating actions against it. And it's not only for Earth as well, of course. We're going to get the same space weather, but actually much worse on the Moon and Mars because... We have no protective atmosphere, we have no protective magnetic field from all those charged particles, so it's much more important for any astronauts on, on the Moon and Mars to be able to predict the space weather. All right, so I'm going to start this discussion uh, at the launch, if you don't mind. So that was quite recent. Um, the launch was in February, so we were busy throughout uh, November, December, January preparing for that launch, uh, and that took place from Cape Canaveral in Florida on Pad 41, which is incidentally is the pad where the Voyagers were launched uh, quite a few years ago. So it's quite a historic uh, place for us to be, very exciting for us. Um, and we were launched on a, an Atlas V rocket uh, by United Launch Alliance. And you see here uh, pictures of the booster being erected at the vehicle integration facility. Okay, and then uh, we moved out to the pad. So this is where we roll out the launch vehicle um, from the vehicle integration facility out to the pad itself. That's a few hundred meters, uh, done quite slowly with a crawler. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the integrated launch vehicle with the solar orbiter spacecraft in its fairing on top, and completely dwarfed by four lightning towers. Uh, so the lightning towers um, are critical, of course, to make sure um, that uh, in case of any thunderstorms, any lightning strike would be going to the towers and not to the launch vehicle. And now if I move on to the next slide, these are just some lovely photographs of the launch. Um, so the launch itself was really perfect. 
took place right on the opening edge of the two-hour window, about 11 o'clock at night in, in Florida. And we had a beautiful clear sky, no wind, and so we were able to see the launch trajectory for a good four minutes all the way into, uh, into orbit. And uh, makes a beautiful picture there, also in front of the full moon. Probably, I think, one of the most beautiful launches uh, ever photographed. So, if I can now move to the next slide, I'd like to play uh, a video. This video takes us from that launch uh, into the next phase of the mission. It's what we call the Launch and Early Orbit Operations Phase, or LEOP for short. And um, some exciting things happened immediately after the launch, which I'd like to go through with you, because I think that sets the scene for the next slides as well. So here you can see obviously a simulation of the launch trajectory. This uh, launch field configuration, by the way, the 411 is quite unusual and it's just got a single booster, which is at least an asymmetric configuration. Then the first thing after launch is for the fairing to separate. And once we get to a certain aerodynamic heating and aerodynamic load, which the spacecraft can tolerate, then we get rid of the fairing as soon as possible. That as while the Centaur engine is still firing. And then when we get to the point where we're injected into the final trajectory, which is actually onto an escape orbit towards Venus. I'll explain why Venus later. We separate from the upper stage of the rocket. And then once we've separated, then the separation switches, then trigger the start of an automatic sequence of events. Uh, the first event is to engage communications back down to Earth, and then soon afterwards we deploy the solar arrays automatically. It's schedule critical to do so, of course, because up until this point we've been running on batteries for about an hour and a half. And we, uh, we only have a limited battery capacity, so we do need to get the power to the spacecraft as soon as we can. So deployment of the solar arrays is done automatically. And these uh, solar arrays, I'll talk about them later, they're a wingspan of about 18 meters, three panels. They were actually qualified for the Bepi Colombo mission, that's a mission that was uh, launched towards Mercury uh, about 18 months ago and we've reused that technology, slightly modified for our mission. So then once we've deployed the solar arrays, we then start to make all the other deployments as well. Um, so the first thing we deploy is the um, antenna for the radio plasma wave instrument. That's about 6.5 meter antenna that we use to measure plasma waves in space. Then the next deployment we'll do is the instrument boom. This is a 4.5 double articulated boom that's used to remove, if you like, the instruments, so the, the instruments would like to be as far away from the space as possible and put them at the back of the spoon. So the magnetometer, for instance, which, which doesn't want to have too much magnetic field from the spacecraft, we put that as far away as possible. And the same with the instruments that measures low-speed electrons. Uh, those low-speed electrons are also uh, perturbed by any charge that's on the spacecraft, so we put those as far from the spacecraft as well. And then we deployed the last two radio antennas, each time rotating the spacecraft towards the sun so that the hinges of those mechanisms are always nice and warm. And then towards the end of the automatic sequence we'll deploy the high gain antenna. Up until this point we've been running communicating with the Earth on the low gain antennas which are omnidirectional. Uh, but during the mission we want to transmit all of the data through this high gain antenna it's got a beam width of about one degree, so it has to be very accurately pointed towards the Earth, and a dish of about 2.2 meters, so it gives you a very high gain, it allows a data rate, uh, in principle, up to 27 gigabits per day. So when we get, uh, when we're in orbit, uh, we're not there yet. Um, we're going to get to Venus in December this year, 
first thing we'll do is a gravity assist flyby of Venus. So we've been heading to Venus all this time. We fly over Venus to give us a little gravitational kick, a slingshot maneuver. Unlike um, some of the missions that go to the outer planets, uh, there we use uh, Jupiter and Saturn and so on to give us extra speed. Here we're using Venus to actually slow us down. Um, in order to get closer to the sun we need to slow down. So we actually use Venus to slow us down and slingshot us backwards if you like. And once we've done two Venus flybys, then we actually come back to Earth and we'll do a gravity assist flyby of Earth in November 2021, so just over a year from now. And Bepi uh, Colombo recently completed its uh, gravity assist flyby of Earth a few months ago. And uh, as you can actually see the spacecraft with telescopes from the Earth. It's quite exciting to think that Solar Orbit will be back for a last goodbye a year from now. In the operational orbit, and we've already performed this activity now, we then open these doors. I'll explain what these doors are for um, later. Um, but of course, they're all single port failures. We, we need to make sure that those doors all work. So they're designed to make sure that they do operate successfully. And then we can take pictures. And I'll show you some of the pictures that we've taken already emissions so far at the end of the presentation. So I think this is a great uh, mock-up, if you like, of what the spacecraft will look like in its operational orbit when it's 0.3 astronomical units from, from the Sun. So that's the, um, if you like, the early phase of the mission. Um, I'd like to run another little video for you now. This is, uh, in 35 seconds, the complete 10-year mission. Said we are in an orbit, that's about where we are right now. Intersect Venus, so we do the first Venus flyby, that's the one that we do in December. Then we'll intersect it again, one orbit of Venus later, and then we fly by Earth then. So that's the Earth flyby. We then drop down into a much more elliptical orbit um, with an, an perihelion, which is about 0.3 AU. And then we're in this kind of what we call a resonance orbit. So every four orbits or so we do, uh, we match it with Venus three orbits of Venus later. So we can always be sure to meet it with Venus when we want to. And when we do, we're going to get further gravitational kicks. You see there's another one. And these gravitational kicks, rather than change our perihelion distance, they're going to increase the inclination of the orbit and that's why we're going to get those beautiful views of the poles later and so every uh, year and a half or so we'll get that extra little kick each one of these Venus flybys and we'll do about seven of these Venus flybys all together in the mission and then towards the end of the mission around about 2030 after seven of these Venus flybys we will be then be at a, an inclination of about 33 or 34 degrees We'll be getting a fantastic view of the poles from that one. So I'd like to then move on from that description of the launch and the early orbit phase uh, of Solar Orbiter and now talk a little bit about the design of the spacecraft. So I'll move on to the next slide. This slide shows um, the spacecraft with the heat shield there. You can clearly see um, the feed-throughs of the telescopes which uh, end in, in, in tubes covered by doors over the apertures which open and close. In fact, we keep them generally closed for the entire mission until the unless the instruments are taking photographs. Um, you can also see uh, the RPW antennas, radio plasma wave antennas there, uh, which are extremely long, 6.5 meters. Um, and the instrument boom, you can just make out at the back of the spacecraft there, 4.4 meters, and the high gain antenna. Um, Dry mass of the spacecraft was about 1,500 kilos, and we launched with about 250 kilos of fuel. Um, we don't actually need a lot of fuel because we're actually in a, in a passive trajectory. We just steer the spacecraft precisely to um, re-engage with Venus uh, each orbit. So we're in this um, resonant orbit, as I mentioned. So every, say, four orbits of the spacecraft, will, or Venus will do three. So we just need to make sure we keep that pattern going. So we just need to fire thrusters every now and then to, to keep on track. Um, 
to meet Venus when we want to meet it. Um, we also use thrusters to offload the wheels, which are used to control the attitude of the spacecraft. Um, so the wheels uh, are generally controlling the spacecraft all of the time in terms of its attitude control. And then when the wheel speed gets too high, we use the thrusters to remove the angular momentum from the wheels. But other than that, we don't use a lot of fuel. So we have plenty of fuel for certainly uh, the nominal mission duration and maybe for much, much longer. So generally, uh, power, um, 1,300 watts at the end of life, uh, the furthest point from the sun. Um, we don't have a power problem with the solar array, so we have plenty of power. Um, the problem, if you like, with the solar array is not one of power, but one of temperature. When we get to the sun, if we would have the solar arrays uh, perpendicular to the sun, as they're effectively shown in this photo, uh, the solar arrays would get enormously hot, as hot as the heat shield, uh, potentially. Uh, and it's not designed to get that hot. In fact, solar arrays uh, are generally use a lot of glues. So the, um, the photovoltaic assemblies are generally glued onto the, the carbon substrate panels. And these glues tend to melt around about 300 degrees centigrade. So if you let the solar arrays get above 300 degrees, they're going to start falling apart. Uh, and we avoid that problem by tilting them. So the solar arrays are not actually facing the sun when we get closer to the sun, as, as it shows in this photo there, they're almost edge on. We tilt them all the way up to about 78 degrees off the sunlight. Uh, and that keeps them, in fact, cool. They're just, they're just showing the edges to the sun. So that's, that's quite a unique feature of the mission. Go on to the next slide. And here you can show you now the uh, suite of scientific instruments that we have on board the spacecraft. It's really huge number, uh, 10 instruments in total, but each instrument is having a number of telescopes, individual sensors, boxes, and in fact, um, if you count all the individual components of the payload, it's about 31 units altogether. So it's really a laboratory. We're taking a complete scientific laboratory. And then we can split these 10 instruments into the four in situ instruments and the six remote sensing instruments. As I mentioned earlier, out of the four in situ instruments, we have uh, energetic particle detector, and that comes in a number of different sensors, some looking for uh, heavy ions and so on, some looking for protons. Um, we have a very, very sensitive magnetometer that's flown a number of times in space before, but each time it uh, improves its performance and sensitivity. And now we're flying the latest state of the art. Um, this is so accurate, so precise, uh, that it's extremely difficult to test on Earth because of the Earth's magnetic field swamps the sensor. It needs to be tested in very special facilities. It also means that if the spacecraft itself had any magnetic field, that would also swamp the sensors. So you'll see that on the boom we have two uh, magnetometers. One is called the inboard and the other is the outboard sensor. And basically what we do is use the inboard sensor to subtract off the spacecraft field from the outboard sensor. So it's a differential sensor, if you like. Um, even then, we, without using this clever tri trick of self-calibration, um, the, the, the uh, spacecraft's magnetic field itself has to still be extremely low. We want to measure magnetic fields down to the order of a few picotesla. And the Earth's magnetic field is 100,000 times bigger than that. Um, it means that the spacecraft magnetic field has to be down at the level of 10 to 20 nanoteslas before this instrument can really perform at its best. And so one of the design challenges I'll come on to later is making sure that the spacecraft itself doesn't have a magnetic field. And you'll see as well at the end of the instrument boom is the solar wind analyzer um, that comes in three different flavors. The one at the end of the boom is the electron sensor. As I mentioned earlier, that wants to ensure that it sees the biggest field of view as it can of space. So it wants to make the spacecraft look small. So we put it on the end of a very long boom. But it also um, is sensitive to electrons being uh, deflected by any charge on the spacecraft. So if the spacecraft would have a charge of, say, 10 or 20 volts in space, it's con constantly saturated with charge. Uh, current is flowing through space all the time, and, and, and this will settle on the outer surfaces and charge it up just, just as you have electrostatic discharge on Earth. 
So we need to make sure that the spacecraft is completely conductive on the outside so that the surface is very, very low voltage. And then as a result, the electrons are not being bent and deflected as they pass the spacecraft on the way to the sensor. And then we also have the three radio plasma wave antennas that I mentioned that are looking for all sorts of radio signatures and plasma waves in, in the plasma around the spacecraft. And then we have uh, the six remote sensing instruments. We have uh, an ultraviolet imager, EUI, and I'll show a photograph taken by that instrument later. We have a coronagraph that's looking at the atmosphere of the sun, so it has a, a central portion of the telescope is blocked out, otherwise the glare from the sun would swamp very faint light you can see from the corona and that's uh, an, an ultraviolet instrument which means as well that it's very sensitive to diffraction effects if you would have any particular contamination inside the aperture so it actually leads to another design driver for us which is to absolutely minimize the number of par particles that could enter the apertures of the instruments and I'll explain the special measures we've taken um, to, to look after that problem we have as well the polarimetric and helioseismic imager, short, short form we call it phi, um, and that's really looking for sun quakes on the sun. Um, but it's also a very clever instrument that can measure vertical speeds um, of the convective flows inside the sun as well. Um, so that's quite a sophisticated instrument. We have as well the heliospheric imager, which is provided by NASA, called Solar High. That instrument is looking sideways from the sun, um, between 5 degrees to 45 degrees off, off bore site. And it's looking for reflections scattered back from the solar wind, so that it can actually image uh, particles in the solar wind by looking at the faint reflected light. Uh, and again, that, that provides another design driver for the spacecraft, because any reflected light coming from the spacecraft, any reflections from the solar array, or anything else that's, that might be sticking out in, in the sun could reflect from, uh, those reflections would completely swap this instrument. And um, we need to make sure that none of this so-called stray light can enter the aperture of that instrument. And to an astonishing degree, it's, uh, the requirement is something like 10 to the minus 14, so 100 million millionth of the sun's light is, is uh, the limit for what we can accept in terms of stray light. And that's very challenging. Um, and then we have um, a spectrometer called SPICE. Uh, and then we also have a spectrometer and a telescope that's imaging in X-ray. So we have a lot of different wavelength images from X-ray, UV, um, visual, uh, and other uh, instruments that can measure things that are not related to the electromagnetic spectrum as well. So it's, it's, it's an unbelievably complex an extensive laboratory that we're taking there. And what's quite interesting as well is when, when you have all these different instruments that have their own special needs, some of these special needs can actually conflict. And actually finding a spacecraft design that, that satisfies or even optimizes the, the needs of all of these 10 different instruments, it's, it's a very, very difficult design challenge. I'll come on to that a bit later. So for now, to talk briefly about how we're going to operate the spacecraft. So basically, we point at the sun for the entire mission. Um, it's because we want, generally want to take pictures of the sun, but also because we want to use a heat shield to protect us from very high temperatures, and I'll explain that a bit later as well, um, which means that we point the heat shield at the sun and hide behind that in its shadow, and that's how we manage the general temperature extremes that we have during this mission. Uh, we can depoint it a little bit to, to focus, on, say, on the limb of the sun if we want to take some off-limb observations, but, but more or less we're pointing at the sun or within three degrees of the sun for the entire mission duration. We are effectively data rate constrained, so we love to take huge volumes of data, but we can only get a certain percentage of that data back to Earth. Um, we are sometimes 300 million kilometers away from Earth, at that distance, even with a two-meter dish, um, we are quite limited uh, in what we can send back. Um, we are collecting data all the time from the Institute instruments, but from the remote sensing instruments, we plan to operate in three specific remote sensing windows of about 10 days each. 
Um, one of them at the perihelion, of course, we want to take pictures when we're at the closest approach to the sun. But um, also when the orbit is tilted, we also want to take pictures uh, of the north pole of the sun and the south pole of the sun. So what we call the max, maximum heliospheric latitude and the minimum heliospheric latitude. So these are, if you like, the, the primary slots, closest approach and uh, the best view of the north and south poles. And, uh, and what, when those signs science windows are running, we take huge volumes of data, which we may not be able to get back to Earth straight away because at those points in the Sun's orbit, the Earth may be on the other side, so far from the spacecraft. And we effectively wait um, for the spacecraft to get closer to Earth and return the data in batches. Because when we get close, we can hit the maximum download speed, which is about, uh, well, it's designed to be 27 gigabits per day. In fact, we think we can uh, even increase that now as things are working uh, extremely well with the spacecraft at the moment. And in fact, uh, as well, just to make sure that um, we don't miss anything, uh, the instruments themselves can communicate between themselves. So if one instrument detects something, they have automatic detection algorithms on board, um, it can actually send signals to the other instruments and say, hey, I've found something interesting over here, why don't you guys take a look? Um, and that's important because uh, we can be out of contact with Earth. Certainly for some hours, um, we, we tend to have a, a contact window of something like eight hours per day. But at times when the spacecraft is behind the sun from the Earth's point of view, so uh, superior conjunction, um, we will effectively be uh, in a kind of radio downtime. It's difficult to get a signal back past the sun um, towards the Earth, and it could be uh, that we're out of contact from the Earth for a couple of months even, in, in the worst case. Um, and so during those two months, it's important that we don't have to interact with the instruments. They have to be fully automatic, even if um, we don't know what they're going to see. So if they see something interesting, they have to be able to take care of that themselves and, and organize it between themselves. And then finally, um, it's, it's an important time for us to launch uh, this year because... NASA's Parker Solar Probe was already in orbit since August 2018. Uh, it was always hoped that the two spacecraft could be in orbit together, and we've now achieved that goal uh, because the Parker Solar Probe is, of course, much closer to the sun. I think it gets to within nine solar radii later in the mission um, and fly actually fly through the corona. Um, but it's so hot, it can't use cameras at all, so it can't do any imaging, can't take any pictures of the sun. Um, and it also has quite a limited number of sensors compared to our huge laboratory. But between the two of them, um, we can actually do more science than would be possible with one alone. So we do actually now coordinate with NASA on uh, maximizing the science return from both these missions. So I'd now like to move on to talk about some of the design challenges that we've had with Solar Orbiter. Solar Orbiter is a complicated scientific spacecraft with a complicated design. I'd like to explain a little bit why it's so complicated, uh, why we have so many design drivers. So let me talk about some of those design challenges uh, which has kept, kept us busy over the last few years. Um, the most obvious one I think you realize is how to survive the extreme temperatures. Um, we get up to something like 600 degrees centigrade at the front of the spacecraft. Uh, but at the back of the spacecraft, on the boom, for instance, which is always in shadow, we get down to about minus 180 degrees. Even when we're so close to the sun, in the shadow, it's, it's extremely cold. We have to manage those uh, cold extremes as well. Then we have a number of specific needs of the instruments, which I've already mentioned, um, some of them at least. Um, some instruments have um, CCDs in their cameras, which will operate at very cold temperatures minimize the loss. So while we're even so close to the sun with a heat chill at 600 degrees, we have to keep those instruments down at even minus 60 degrees centigrade, which is uh, very impressive. And I'd like to just explain a little bit how that's even possible. It's so like trying to keep an ice cube cold in front of a bar fire. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, I'll explain a little bit how it works. Um, we have other instruments as well that are extremely sensitive to humidity. Um, others, like the UV telescope I mentioned, that's extremely sensitive to particulates. 
and um, other instruments, the spectrometers, that are very sensitive to any contamination from molecules. So we have to strongly limit all of those sources. We also have to limit the scattered light, as I mentioned, for solo high and any uh, infrared reflections back onto the spacecraft that could cause additional heating. We have to more or less remove the spacecraft's static magnetic field, which we do by the use of non-metallic materials as far as possible, and where not possible to try to shield those metallic materials from the outside world. We have to also try to remove the spacecraft's static electric field, um, so to basically make sure that any charging in space is grounded by the use of conductive materials everywhere, which sounds easy, except you have to make it work even for things like paint, which is very, very difficult to make that electrically conductive. And then we have to limit the electromagnetic emissions from the spacecraft as well, so radio emissions and so on. Um, all electronic boxes emit electromagnetic waves, but we're trying to measure electromagnetic and electrostatic waves in the plasma with very, very sensitive antennas in our payload. We don't want to measure are the electronic boxes that are operating inside the spacecraft. So we have to strongly limit those EMC emissions as well. So each of the instruments is coming with its own design driver, if you like. And then you, when you put this package together, they make a multi-dimensional set of design drivers, and you have to find the sweet spot in the middle that satisfies all of them. And so and I mentioned some of them are even conflicting with each other. I'll give you a few hints at what those were. We also have to keep the spacecraft pointing within three degrees of the sun forever for the whole mission, which means that any fault detection, isolation and recovery um, has to be extremely fast. So if you can imagine you have a thruster failure or a wheel failure, the depointing is going to happen within seconds, tens of seconds. So your FDIR has to react within about 30 seconds to switch over to the redundant units and to bring the spacecraft back under control. Um, we also have to keep the spacecraft safe when out of contact and I mentioned that could be up to a couple of months or slightly more, um, which means that if you have a fault on your spacecraft or you're out of contact from Earth for two months, the spacecraft has to completely take care of itself. In, in any failure scenario, which means you have to imagine every failure scenario and make sure you have something to do about that, which means your FDIR, your fault detection, has to be extremely deep in terms of the number of things that can recover from, as well as fast. So the software on the spacecraft is as challenging as the hardware was. We'll move on to the next slide. So let's talk about how we survive temperatures of 600 degrees. And we do that by using a heat shield. Now, this heat shield is made of multiple layers of titanium foil. And the outer surface of the titanium foil is coated with a material that was developed as an enabling technology for this mission, um, developed in Ireland by a company called Embio, and it's, it's called Solar Black. And it was developed especially for this mission. We wanted to find a material that was black, that gave the right emissivity properties uh, under solar illumination, but wasn't degraded at all by such a strong ultraviolet uh, environment that you find close to the sun, it doesn't discolor. So for instance, we couldn't use anything that was white, uh, because white turns to grey very quickly under such kind of degrading conditions. Um, it turned out that um, the best material to use, and you, you may have read about this in the press, is crushed animal bones. Um, so you actually um, use animal bones and, and burn them, crush them. And then you blast them onto the surface of the titanium foil so that it becomes effectively integrated with the surface. Um, it forms part of the atomic layer of the outer surface of the titanium. Um, and that links a little bit to the special properties of titanium, which you may know uh, is used in dental fittings and so on because it forms a tight bonding with, with bone material. So it's the same kind of chemistry. So it's it's very uh, interesting material. Um, and without that material, this mission wouldn't be possible. So it really was a true enabling technology. Um, and that's been developed, as I said, uh, some nine years ago now. Uh, um, and 
as it worked so well, uh, we also coated a number of other items in that material as well. So, for instance, the high gain antenna, antenna is also completely covered in this solar black material. And how does it work? Well, basically, you're reflecting as much uh, sunlight as you can from the outer surface. Any uh, sunlight that just gets through the first layer of foils is then entering this gap, which of course is a vacuum gap in space. And the, uh, the infrared photons will rattle about inside that gap, and hopefully the vast majority of them will, will escape out of the sides of that gap. And only a few will then go on to the second layer. And again, then it faces another multiple layer of um, titanium foils. So that by the time you get through two layers and, and this big gap, um, you're down to a temperature of about 100, 120 degrees from 600. And then you have, uh, if you like, normal protection from the aluminium outer surface of the spacecraft. But inside the spacecraft, you're, you're much more benign, 20 degrees centigrade. But uh, that's all very nice and well, but we actually want to open the doors and take pictures with the instruments. And of course, as soon as we do that, all of that heat which you've managed to shield yourself from, is then immediately transmitted into the instrument uh, apertures and into the instrument uh, internals. Um, and we have to get rid of that heat, otherwise the instruments themselves will melt. So we have to find a way to get huge amounts of heat flow very quickly from the front of the spacecraft and transmit it out of the side. And we do that with another enabling technology which is part of what we call the SOAR, the standoff radiator assembly. You can see the white squares in the picture on the bottom right, and also par partially in the picture of the one on the, one on the left. Uh, they're hidden by the solar rays in that case. But of course, the solar rays are deployed in space, so all of these white radiators are facing deep space. Um, so the radiators themselves and also thermal straps which connect the radiators directly to the instrument sensitive surfaces. And they form, if you like, a cold finger. You can see the strap in the top right hand photograph. So one end of that strap is at the temperature of the radiator, uh, which could be, say, 60 or 80 degrees centigrade. And the other end of the strap is at the temperature of the instrument, which could be, say, minus 60 degrees. So you have a big temperature differential across that strap. And what's special about the strap is it's it's made from a material called pyrolytic graphite, uh, and that's the second enabling technology of the mission. Interestingly, another material made from carbon. Um, that material has been around for a long time. I think NASA invented it in the 1960s or discovered it. Um, but it's the first time we've flown it in space, to my knowledge. It's a material which is five times more conductive than copper, um, but it's extremely flexible as flexible, I would say, as paper. Um, so it's it's perfect for transmitting huge heat loads, but at the same time wanting to transmit no mechanical loads. Remember that the cold finger is connected potentially directly to the CCD of the instrument camera, and the other end is the radiator, which is shaking around during the launch quite violently. Uh, what you don't want is to transmit any loads down that strap uh, into the instrument sensitive components. Um, so it's extremely flexible, uh, but it's a difficult material to deal with. It's quite brittle, um, so it was a challenge to qualify that enabling technology for the mission, um, but uh, we've been fully successful. They're also coated with another enabling technology. You can see they're covered in a white paint. That white paint is um, also developed by the Irish company Embio called Solar White. It's actually a white paint coated on top of solar black. So first we coat them with the black uh, coating, then we paint them white. And then because the paint itself is not very conductive, we then put a, an ITO coating, Indian titanium oxide, uh, Indian tin oxide um, coating on top of the white paint. So quite a complex technology, which is absolutely necessary if you want to stop your instruments from melting. Then we can talk a little bit about contamination. Um, this has been really a big challenge for the mission, but it's ultimately turned out to be extremely successful. So the instruments themselves have very stringent requirements. So molecular contamination, for instance, we can tolerate no more than a thousand nanograms per square centimetre. So that's really not a lot. Um, generally, 
materials, glues, plastics, they will outgas volatiles in space in a vacuum. We can't tolerate any of that molecular um, contamination, which means that we do a systematic bake out of every spacecraft unit before we fit it to the spacecraft. So well, every unit has been through a thermal chamber and heated to more than 100 degrees C for days, sometimes weeks, um, in order to make sure all the volatiles are removed, um, which, is, which is a huge endeavor, but we've achieved that. Um, we also have to take great care when we're in the thermal vacuum chamber, uh, which I'll show you later, um, when we recover from um, very cold and vacuum conditions back to normal ambient conditions. Uh, any uh, vapors that are in the spacecraft can suddenly uh, come out of the spacecraft and that has to be very tightly controlled. We have to take very special care of that phase of the mission. We also have very tight requirements on particulate contamination. Generally we build this spacecraft in what we call an ISO 7 environment. Um, in fact the requirement is ISO 8 but we've achieved more or less ISO 7 for the entire AIT phase which was about three years. Um, but even then um, we have to make sure we, we cover all these instruments continually. Some of them are in bags, some of them are double bagged. Um, we also can have no materials which shed any fibers. So we can't tolerate glass fibers or plastic fibers on the spacecraft. Um, and that led us to another very, very challenging problem that we encountered, which was um, to build the heat shield we had to sew together the titanium foil blankets and they were sewed together with a PTFE thread and it happened that during normal handling um, this fibre of the threads could emit small fibrous particles which could not be tolerated uh, with this kind of very stringent contamination requirement which means we had to go back and replace all of the threads with mechanical staples quite late in the build of the spacecraft. So you can see this, you get these kind of conflict between on the one hand wanting to do something which is meeting the thermal conditions in the best possible way, but then finding out that it causes a contamination issue. You have to find another way to solve it which then doesn't make the thermal design worse. We also have instruments which have to be uh, never would never see the humidity from the normal atmosphere. It's always below 10% relative humidity, which means that we have to purge them with dry nitrogen gas from the minute that we fit them to the spacecraft, which is about three years before we launch it. So for three years, we have to be sure that this purge system is working, that the nitrogen gas that we feed into the instrument is always dry, um, and that requires us then to have a purge supply system, which is fully automatic, fully redundant, um, can take care of itself in any failure scenario, day or night, um, to make sure that we have no unplanned purge outages where humidity can creep in to any of these instruments. And then finally, um, because the UV telescope for METIS is so very sensitive to particulate contamination, one single hundred micron particle inside the aperture would lose a significant fraction of the science due to diffraction effects. Um, we have to fit that with a special cap, and that cap is actually ejected in space. Uh, and of course, the cap itself has to be ultra clean uh, when we fit it on the ground. And then finally, we flew, I think it's for the first time, at least for Europe, uh, a contamination monitoring system in space. So we have an electronic box that actually measures what the contamination environment is around the spacecraft, which is great because it means that you know um, if you have any outgassing around the spacecraft when it's finished before you do any critical operations like opening doors. And in fact, we've, we've used that system to prove that uh, the environment around the spacecraft is astonishingly low, so all of the mitigations we took all worked, um, but also it enabled us to open the door on the sensitive instrument solar high much, much earlier than we probably would have been able to do had we not had an in-orbit measurement system. So contamination has been a very, very interesting and challenging design driver, and as I mentioned, conflicting sometimes with some of the other design drivers. And then briefly, perhaps I could talk about electrostatic charging. 
So I mentioned earlier that the solar arrays uh, were qualified on a Depi Global mission, and um, that mission doesn't have a requirement for electrostatic charging, which means um, the carbon fiber panels on which they're built can simply be left bare. Um, had we taken the same solar arrays, we then found that carbon fiber panels charge up quite significantly because they're insulated, uh, which couldn't be tolerated. Um, and so we had to uh, fit special blankets on the back of the antennas, uh, back of the solar arrays, uh, which are fully conductive and, and basically ground the back of the solar arrays uh, to make sure they don't charge. Um, and that was another challenging retrofit we made. Very successful, by the way. And then another um, interesting challenge we had was the reaction wheels, which are basically made of spinning magnets. Now, I mentioned earlier we shouldn't have any magnetic materials on the spacecraft because then they'll swamp the sensitive magnetometers. But we have to have reaction wheels and they have to be spinning magnets. So what can we do about that? We built a, a shield which encases the reaction wheels. Um, and it's made out of a special material called mu metal. It's about one millimeter thick. And it has the interesting property that it reduces the magnetic field of the wheels by about one million through that one millimeter. Um, so that was sufficient. and We've proved it sufficient in test um, to make the reaction wheels actually completely disappear. You cannot see the reaction wheels from the magnetometers in space, which is astonishing because the magnetic field of the, of the wheels is about a million million times too high. But, but it's strongly attenuated by the shield. Um, and of course, encasing a reaction wheel inside a shield can give you other problems. It, it makes it actually warmer than you'd like it to be. You'd like the, the reaction wheels to radiate into free space, but you've got it now inside a shield, so you have to take special care of its thermal properties, simply because you've introduced this magnetic shield to the design. So every time you make a change, you, you make something else worse with that we then have to fix, and so on, and round and round you go. I'd like now to move on to the integration phase which took place at the Airbus facilities in Stevenage in Hertfordshire. Uh, we started the integration of the flight spacecraft in February 2016 with the arrival of the first unit and we completed it in September 2018 when we shipped the complete spacecraft to the environmental test facilities in Munich in Germany. Uh, I didn't really say much about how we were able to build um, such a complex spacecraft. It is, of course, an enormous international undertaking. Um, we've actually had something like uh, 90 subcontractors and, and many, many sub more suppliers uh, providing individual components and subsystems. Um, most of those are from Europe and some in the US and some further afield. So it really is uh, an international project. Um, so let me then move on to the next slide and I can describe that for you. Um, in this slide, you'll see three components. I'm showing it now because I'm going to show video in a second, which goes by very quickly. So it's, it's good to look at the static photo first. On the, in the middle, you see the core spacecraft, uh, which is containing the, the central tube, uh, uh, which is connected to the launch vehicle adapter at the bottom. Inside the tube are the propellant tanks, um, and then all of the structure around that to enable you to mount the two panels. On the right hand side you've got the service panel, um, which is um, also including a, a mezzanine panel for the communication subsystem. So more or less the whole of the spacecraft is controlled from that panel on the right, or from boxes that are on the core structure in the middle. And then on the left you've got the minus Y panel, which is for the payload remote sensing instruments, and, and a couple of others called his and pass, which look at the side of the each unit. Um, and that can be indicated completely separately then from the race, rest of the spacecraft. And when the last instrument is ready and, and installed, we can then put the panel onto the core structure. So I wanted to show you that first because I'm now going to uh, play the video. Hopefully this works. It's basically um, the last three months months of the integration phase at Stevenage from June to September, but in 168 seconds. So we took this with a time-lapse camera, and you'll see uh, that it's quite frantic. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, all of the items are generally covered with these contamination covers. Um, even though we're in effectively ISO 7 conditions, it's still too high for the particulate environment, which means we have to keep everything always covered with these uh, contamination covers. And even then, the instruments are bagged inside of those covers. We take extra special precautions. So now you see the core structure is mounted on the handling adapter. We're now about to install the service panel on the right to the side of the spacecraft. And these panels, they weigh about 400 kilos or more, and they have to be installed with an accuracy of a fraction of a millimeter. So it's a very challenging uh, operation. So that's the PY panel, the service panel integrated now on the right hand side and we're about to install the instrument panel on the left hand side. Sometimes you'll see that it'll go dark, like now. Um, that's for us to take ultraviolet measurements so that we can make a full survey of any particulates that we may have missed in visible light and if we find any we have to remove them. Because, of course, once you've installed the last panel, you don't get access to the inside of the spacecraft anymore. So if you left a particle inside, it's going to stay there until you get into space. And we don't want it there. So we make sure that we thoroughly clean the inside of the spacecraft before we do the final mate. And there's the MY panel fully installed. Now we'll just swing the spacecraft around a bit, of course. This isn't uh, real time, so it actually looks quite violent. It's much, much slower than this in real time. Uh, and we measure the alignment of all the different alignment cubes on the spacecraft to make sure there's no distortions anywhere and everything's precisely aligned as we, as we designed it to be. And then towards the end, uh, when we finished all of these final tests, we put it in the box container that's, that's then shipped to the environmental test site in Munich, Germany. And if you blink, you miss it because it's very, very fast. It's very important to get the alignment precisely correct because three of the instruments have a very high resolution telescope which are all co-aligned with each other so they can all look at the same detailed feature on a sun surface or a sunspot for instance or a flare. These three instruments can all take the same picture in the same very small area of the sun so only tens of kilometers across um, which means they all have to be co-aligned to a very very high degree so the alignment of the spacecraft was also a big challenge, but ultimately successful. So now we're in the final packing stage, ready to put in the container.
here you see the container on the right hand side in the box and we're gone so that was the last three months in Stevenage and then we put it on a lorry and took it to IBG facilities in Munich in Germany uh, where we went through then a full environmental test campaign um, a lot more standard I would say than, than the design of the space gut so I don't need to go into probably too much detail first in December 2018 we put it inside the six meter thermal vacuum chamber which you see there uh, the label number one and we put the space cuff through uh, its temperature extremes not the full temperature extremes of the mission because no facility in Europe can heat a full space cuff up to 600 degrees uh, but it was sufficient to thermally qualify the heat shield and uh, the solar arrays and the antenna which do see those temperatures separately and, and qualify the spacecraft uh, up to more reasonable temperatures of, of about 250 degrees centigrade. But we also took it down to very cold temperatures as well. Then um, we did the mechanical vibration test. So we do a sign vibration test. Here's the sign shaker with IVG um, and that qualifies us for the launch phase. Then on the right hand side in number three you see the acoustic test, you see the two large loudspeakers on the right hand side again these qualifiers for the very extreme acoustic environment of the launch phase and then uh, on the bottom left you see uh, labeled four uh, we check the mass properties of the spacecraft so we weigh it um, dry and then we also do a, a moment of inertia test to confirm uh, everything's exactly as we predicted for our uh, attitude control and then in number five we put it inside the electromagnetic chamber and uh, we radiate the spacecraft and test it with sensitive antennas and make sure that everything's compatible and everything works with everything else. That was all highly successful. And then a special test we did for Solar Orbiter. This is the uh, wooden facility that they have just uh, a few kilometers from the test site at IBG uh, in Munich. Um, and it's used to do a magnetic test of the spacecraft. So it's, it's built of wood and aluminium to, to have no magnetic signature. But we still have to remove the magnetic field of the Earth, and this is done with two giant, I mean, they're really huge Helmholtz coils, uh, which completely null in that magnetic field of the Earth. And then you can measure for the first and only time what is the actual magnetic signature of the spacecraft. And we measured it in this test to be seven nanoteslas, which was absolutely fantastically low. So all of the difficulties we had with the design and the build of the spacecraft to make sure we, we kept it magnetically clean uh, all worked and then uh, when we measured the magnetic field in space we got exactly the same value 7 nanotesla so it's extremely low so the magnetic uh, instrument operation should be really really good so very successful test campaign and that takes us up to where I started at the beginning of the presentation with the preparation for launch and the launch and then the obvious one. I jump now to um, the results. So since the launch we've been commissioning the spacecraft, that commissioning was finished in June and then uh, a number of um, science uh, activities were performed very early because the, the normal science operators don't actually start to get into the operational orbit um, and we don't get to that um, first low perihelion until March 2022. So 2022 is the start of the formal science operations. Up until then when what we call the cruise phase, flying to Venus twice and to Earth to get those slingshot maneuvers. But of course we can start to use the instruments and test them out, but they still have to be calibrated and optimized. Um, and so we took some very, very early photographs uh, in May, just a month or so after switching the instruments on. Uh, and um, they were astonishing, at least I, I, I find them astonishing. So here's a picture of the sun taken in ultraviolet. Um, at a distance of 0.56 AU. Remember, this is the closest photograph of the sun ever taken already um, this year. Um, showing the sun in a very quiet stage. We're actually at the solar minimum right now, um, so we don't expect to see much activity. Um, but over the next few years, we'll start to see this really build and build and build. You can perfectly see all the plasma um, streaming out along the magnetic field lines. You can see the north and south pole of the sun slightly darker with all the magnetic field lines going normally into those um, poles and they do look different from this photo you, you get the tantalizing glimpse that you really want to look down on those from above and, and see what they look like 
So this is a full sun image, and then of course we have instruments that can take much, much higher resolution. Um, so if I go now to one of these photos. Um, so here you probably heard that um, we discovered these things called campfires, which we think are very, very small flares, uh, but which are happening everywhere, all over the sun, even in this quiet solar minimum phase. Uh, and we think these are somehow fundamental for uh, the reasons for how the solar wind is generated and so on. And so already after just a couple of months in space, well before the science phase is really starting, we're already discovering new things, things that we can't see from Earth, things that we don't understand and, and, and need to develop new theories. And so it's exactly why uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the presentation, why do we want to go to the sun? We've found out already after a couple of months that we're really getting all of the answers that we wanted to get. And so I think it really does show uh, it's going to be a fantastic mission. We've got uh, hopefully 10 years in orbit. Um, we're going to discover many, many new things about the sun that, uh, that we didn't know and cannot know uh, without, without solar orbiting. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, don't forget... The next event for Solar Orbiter is the flyby of Venus. That's going to take place on the 27th of December this year, so just after Boxing Day. Hopefully there'll be something uh, that we can see online or on the television to tell us how that went. Um, so that's, that's going to be a very interesting and exciting event. Um, and then I really look forward to the next 10 years of this mission. I think it's going to be really exciting. We're going to learn a lot about the sun and I think that we couldn't have learned if we hadn't built Solar Orbiter. So I wish Solar Orbit all the best in its mission, um, and I look forward to some of the questions you're going to have for me. Thank you.